We'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr Adrian McQuillan. Mr McQuillan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. First Minister, as we approach the anniversary of the Belfast City Council's decision to remove the Union flag and the protest march planned for the 30th of November, do you as First Minister believe that this should take place? Well, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I think the first thing that we should say is that there are very few people in this chamber uh, who have not been involved at some stage in their careers in uh, protest politics. Uh, so uh, I, I think we, we need to recognise that demonstrations and protests and picket are, are picketing are part of the democratic process. It allows people to express their, their views. It allows them to show uh, opposition. So, of course, uh, we support people's right to, to demonstrate, uh, providing, of course, that they do it within the law and they do it uh, peacefully. Uh, equally, of course, we have to defend other rights and the rights of uh, traders uh, who want to ensure that uh, their businesses can remain open and that they have the opportunity, particularly in the run-up to, to Christmas, which accounts for a significant part of their, their business, uh, to be able to, to trade. And there's the rights, of course, of uh, consumers uh, who want to avail of uh, those uh, services. So, uh, as is so often the case in Northern Ireland, we are dealing with uh, competing rights. Uh, I have to say that it seems to me that in relation to this matter, uh, as the actual anniversary of the decision by Fel Belfast City Council uh, comes earlier in the week than the, the, the Saturday, uh, and also that uh, the decision uh, led to the flag being lowered, which occurred other than on the, the Saturday, it appears to me that uh, a lunchtime protest would do less violence to trade in Belfast, uh, would more accurately uh, be able to protest against the people who took the decision, because I suspect very few of them are going to be in the City Hall on a, a Saturday. Uh, and while it's not ideal for anybody, it, it would be a worthwhile compromise. Call in for a supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Does the First Minister believe that such demonstrations can succeed in effect and change? Well, I'm not sure that even the organisers believe that they will affect change by the, the protests. Protests, and we've all been involved in them, uh, are held to highlight an issue, uh, to ensure that uh, people are aware of concerns. And I suspect that the objective of uh, this particular demonstration is to show that even a year afterwards that uh, people uh, are still opposed to the decision of the, the, the Council. Uh, if change is to take place, change will take place through the democratic process, involvement in politics, involvement uh, in uh, elections, making sure that people who represent your views are elected to Belfast City Council in the future. That's the way to make uh, real change. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, at his party conference on Saturday, uh, the leader of NI21 proposed greater physical powers for, uh, Fiscal powers, uh, sorry, <laughs> for the assembly. For the assembly, uh, does the first minister agree with him, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker? Uh, we have, of course, uh, as an executive, sought additional fiscal powers, uh, and unlike other parts of the United Kingdom, we have been successful. For instance, in our passenger duty for long haul uh, flights. We are also pursuing the additional fiscal powers in relation to corporation tax. Uh, however, I think that the, the member for Lagan Valley uh, was referring to income tax uh, powers. Uh, I, I note that the, the member didn't tell anybody during the course of his uh, speech whether his intention was to raise or to lower taxes, and I'm always suspicious about people who seek a headline, perhaps without having done any research, uh, and uh, don't give details of what their intentions uh, are. Um, I suppose the Basel tax uh, might be to uh, have an additional tax burden on a uh, woman over size 12, uh, or perhaps uh, <laughs> give tax breaks to uh, polygamists. Sir Jimmy Spratt. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the First Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask him what the Executive are doing with the uh, t tax-raising powers it already has uh, to make business more competitive 
uh, and to keep the cost of living down uh, in relation to householders right around this province? Well, I think we should point out that we have the ability in terms of local taxes, because within local taxes you could refer to the regional rate and you could refer to water charges and so forth. Uh, and it is worth noting that Scotland has had a power in relation to income tax for about 14 years now and has never used it. And that maybe should be a lesson to, to, to people as to what's likely to happen uh, if it was to come here. But if we are to reduce income tax by having a local power, then that means reducing the services that are available to our community. Uh, so uh, I haven't been convinced that there is uh, any real advantage in having income tax powers uh, devolved. As to what we're doing already, we have used uh, the, the ability to uh, bring to zero air passenger duty to ensure that we retain the connection uh, with the United States, which was vital from an investment point of view. Uh, we are seeking to have uh, the ability to set uh, corporation tax uh, because we want to reduce it to uh, enhance our offering uh, in terms of uh, the package that is available to uh, investors. So for us, uh, it's in order to have a positive outcome with our uh, economy that we have uh, used it. And where we have held down the regional rate and where we have refused to bring in water charges because we recognise that particularly during this period of recession that there was a very heavy burden being carried by householders in Northern Ireland. Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, in the wake of a further attack on a constituency office, um, attacks on the police and the shooting of a 15-year-old child, could I ask the First Minister whether he feels that the executive ministers are doing enough to separate themselves from those who are seeking to threaten democracy and the rule of law? Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I have already publicly expressed our condemnation of, of uh, these actions. Uh, and I, I do sense a feeling within our community uh, almost of helplessness to be able to uh, affect what is uh, happening uh, by violent uh, organisations and individuals. Uh, but the public isn't powerless in these uh, matters. Uh, we all have the ability uh, to stand up to agitators and uh, aggressors, uh, no matter who they claim to represent. We have the right and uh, ability to speak out against them. Uh, we can provide evidence where it's available uh, to the police to ensure that prosecutions take place. And we must always show them that uh, they cannot succeed and demonstrate that the more they do, the more they will be resisted. Uh, everyone in this House, I believe, can re recall the days uh, when we woke up uh, in the morning to headlines of mayhem and misery. Uh, and we can all recount the horrors and tragedies uh, of the past. I don't believe anyone wants to go back to those uh, bad old uh, days. Uh, and when devolution returned uh, to Northern Ireland in 2007, uh, we all committed ourselves pledged ourselves uh, to this uh, new era in Northern Ireland and to the peace and stability that had been created. Uh, and I hope that each of us will renew that pledge today. Ms. Judith Cochran for a supplement. Thank you, and I thank First Minister for his answer. Um, public opinion would suggest that it's important that, that no elected representative sent mixed messages um, or give comfort or cover to those who would advocate breaking the law. Could I ask, would the First Minister now call on Nelson McCausland to stop sharing platforms and media opportunities with people who are widely considered to have links to paramilitary organisations? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I think everybody recognises that elected representatives have clear responsibilities with their own constituents to try and do everything that they can to ensure that uh, peace is maintained. Yeah. Uh, and the, the role of every elected representative in this House is to ensure that they do make those views known to everybody that they meet uh, in society uh, and to do everything that they possibly can to overcome the, the difficulties that uh, may present them. And I have no doubt that the, uh, the Minister uh, for Social Development uh, uses all of his powers of persuasion to attempt to resolve the, the issues which are causing real difficulty in his constituency and elsewhere. I call Mr Dominic Bradley. 
Um, can I ask uh, the First Minister if he and the Deputy First Minister can confirm or deny uh, that they agreed to the withdrawal of the Noro Water Bridge letter of offer by the SEUPB at the pre-meeting of the recent North-South Ministerial Council? Quite contrary to, to that uh, position, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, agreed at the meeting that uh, took place of the British Irish Council that we would uh, examine uh, other ways of trying to keep the project alive. Uh, we both indicated that, uh, in principle, we were supportive of the, the project. We recognised that the application came from uh, Louth Council. Uh, we recognise that uh, there was a projected uh, cost uh, attached to it, that the SEUPB uh, was to give a certain amount of money and the Council was to pay the rest. Uh, when the projected figures were found to be significantly less than the actual uh, tender price, it became clear that uh, Louth Council could not uh, and was not prepared to pay the, the balance. Uh, the uh, position, therefore, is that we have to look at the, the project and see whether it can be brought forward in any, any other way. Uh, for instance, it was specifically mentioned that it uh, was a pre-designed scheme, uh, and we might look and see whether a design and build scheme uh, would bring a, a better result. We might look and see if a different specification might bring a, a different result, and we might look and see whether uh, there is any other opportunity for funding to come forward. Sir Dominic Bradley. Thank the First Minister for his uh, answer. And can I ask him, given where we are now with the Nora Water Bridge, will he go to the, the Minister of Finance and ask him to find new monies so that Belfast jumps first and that this great project uh, goes forward? Well, the SEUP have already indicated that they are looking to allocate the funds elsewhere because they don't believe that uh, they can proceed uh, with the present timetable, uh, and we must respect their, their decision. Uh, they have the responsibility to ensure that money is spent uh, and that they were not handing money back to, to Europe without having any local uh, advantage. So I think it's important that we do ensure that we get uh, as much funding as possible from Europe. It's part of our programme for government that we do. And therefore, we don't want any time delay uh, to have a, an impact uh, on us. As far as going to the Finance Minister, the, the Finance Minister has to act within Treasury rules, just as uh, in the, the South, they have to uh, operate on the, the basis of value for money in a business case as well. Uh, therefore, any uh, proposal has to be able to get through that uh, business appraisal. Uh, the original price uh, that we were offered for the, the, the scheme of the original uh, projected figure uh, was clearly satisfactory, or the then Finance Minister, Sammy Wilson, would not have approved the, the business case at that stage. Uh, but a business case on the basis of the new tender figure would not get a, a approval, uh, and therefore we do need to, to look at what other ways there are of ensuring that we can have a project that uh, gives a, a value for money outcome uh, can go forward. Mr Sidney Anderson. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the First Minister that in light of the recent comedy surrounding the stalled uh, welfare reform bill, can the First Minister give an assessment of when the bill will be back on the floor of this Assembly and what specific Northern Ireland measures have been agreed? Well, I can't say exactly when it's going to come back in the Assembly because we, we require to have uh, cross-party support for legislation that uh, comes forward. Uh, I find it a bit frustrating in that it's not actually the bill that is the, the issue. It's the regulations that are attached to the, the bill. So perhaps uh, one way forward is for the, the bill to go through its early stages, leave the final stage until the uh, draft regulations are available and people can see uh, what the, the content uh, of them would be. Uh, but the proposals that uh, we do have are proposals which uh, ensure that Northern Ireland uh, would uh, be, have the best welfare system uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, we have uh, addressed a, a number of uh, issues, uh, the three in particular that uh, were raised in the Assembly and by the, the committee have been addressed and those were 
effectively matters that dealt with the administration, the, the uh, number of occasions when payments would be made, etc. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's already publicly known that uh, we have attempted to uh, address the issue of bedroom tax for existing uh, tenants. That is something that um, I suspect that tenants in England, Scotland and Wales would uh, take their, their right arm for. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, it's a significant uh, advance and we've also looked at uh, how with uh, the use of resources we can help uh, other people who are vulnerable. Order, it's, uh, that's the end of topical questions and we must move on now.